I'm using Ruby um, as an example here, but it's mainly about what the JVM can do with languages in general and what we'll be able to do with more languages in the future. Um, but the thing you can take away as, as Java people is what's coming with technology on the JVM, and that's Graal and Truffle. Um, Oracle wants me to remind you that this is just a research project. It's not necessarily a product. It's not something you can go and buy today. Um, and Oracle's not committing to do anything with this project. I'll give you some background. In 2013, I was a PhD student at the University of Manchester. I was researching parallelism and concurrency. Um, and I decided to take some time out to go and work with Oracle and did an internship out in California where their VM research group is primarily based. And I was asked to look at implementing Ruby on top of these two new technologies, Graal and Truffle, which I'll explain. Um, but I kept working with them, and now, uh, after I finished my degree, I've been working full-time with Oracle. So this project's been going on since 2013. The big idea we have in the Virtual Machine Research Group is this idea of one virtual machine to rule them all. The idea that one virtual machine can be a virtual machine which can, which can run many different languages, and not only just run them, but run them really well. So that's the thing we don't currently have with lang other languages on the JVM. Um, we can run lots of languages, but it's not always the, the best implementation of them in terms of performance. And we'd like to fix that and make it so that the JVM can run all the languages well. If you search around and ask people, what is the, the one language to rule them all? What's the one language you should use? Everyone thinks it's their own language. Everyone's got these different opinions on what language is the best language. So the conclusion from that is that um, really we want to let people use the same language they want to use. If you ask Stack Overflow, why can't there be one single program language which does everything, they'll close it as off-topic, unconstructive. Um, we'd like to let people use the languages they want to use, but still make them really high performance. If you look at the, the language spectrum um, of the languages available, um, there's a really big difference in performance in these languages. There's languages like C and C++, which are really fast. Java's just a little bit slower. And then there's languages which are, in some cases, more expressive, but they get slower as they get more expressive. Um, so languages like JavaScript, um, PHP, Ruby, Python are quite a bit slower. And then languages like R, which is a statistical language, is really high level, lets you do really powerful things, but then it's really, really slow. You can see the difference that um, putting a lot of money into a language implementation can make. So JavaScript is, is much faster than languages like Python and PHP. But that's because uh, Google's put, I don't know how many, probably hundreds of millions of dollars into making it fast over the years with a big team, lots of experience, spending lots of time and money on it. You can make those languages a bit faster, but we can't repeat that for all the languages out there. You can't just spend lots and lots of money on all those languages. What we'd like to do is make it so that all languages fit in that kind of fast bracket there. Um, and do it for lots and lots of languages rather than just a, a few. The way current languages are currently implemented is you start off with a, a prototype, um, which is usually a very simple kind of way to run a language called an AST interpreter. Um, and then you may implement that in a language like C, C++, try and make it a bit faster, add a GC, um, add some custom stuff to try and optimize it a bit. Um, but then when people start using it, people will start to complain about performance. The next thing you can do is you can define a bytecode interpreter, and then people still complain about performance, so you can add a JIT, um, and that's where all the money is spent. And what we'd like to do is to be able to say that you can prototype your language really simply, write your language in a simple, clear way, and then have everything else done for you and make it really fast automatically. I'll give you a bit of background on Java internals basics, just in case anyone is more of a Java novice and wants a bit of grounding. When you write a Java program, you send that source code into the, the Java C compiler, and that gives you Java, Java class files, which contain bytecode, and then you run that in Java. Um, but when we say Java compiler, all it does is a simple stage of translation into bytecode. Uh, when I talk about compiler, I mean a just-in-time compiler. So when I say compiler in this talk, I mean just-in-time compiler. And that's going from that Java bytecode to something like x86 machine code, uh, which may be called assembly code, and that's what, what we actually run on the CPU. If you want to know more about JVMs, here's a, a great talk to go away and watch. It's uh, Cliff Clicks, a JVM does that, which will explain to you all the guts inside a, a JVM and what they all do. You just Google for a JVM does that, you'll find it. So Truffle. Truffle is our solution to the problem of we want to be able to write languages in a simple way. So that simple, easy way to write languages, which is straightforward. 
When you write a, a guest language on the JVM, so I mean something other than Java, like Ruby or JavaScript or, or Python or something like that that's running on top of the JVM, we call that a guest language. And the way they normally work is they send bytecode to the JVM. So they generate some Java bytecode from your, your program and send that to the JVM. The Graal VM is the technology I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, which is our new and improved JVM, which includes technology for making these languages fast. Graal VM provides us an interface for uh, making high performance languages, allows you to directly control the machine code that's generated, allows you to do advanced things like invalidation and deoptimization and apply particular optimizations to your code. But Graal is really complicated technology. It's a, a compiler, it's a hard piece of technology to use. So what Truffle does is it sits between you and Graal VM. And the, all you have to do is talk to Truffle. And all you have to do is write the simplest type of interpreter, an AST interpreter. I'll explain that a bit more depth in a minute. Um, and then Truffle, on your behalf, talks to Graal to make that really fast. So what's normally being done for each language individually, making all this really complicated stuff of writing a, a JIT and stuff like that, that's being done on your behalf by Truffle speaking to Java, to Graal. And all you have to do is write a really simple language implementation, and that'll be done automatically. <laughs> So this is our big idea for language implementations. If you've never done any kind of compilers courses, the, the simplest way to write a language is something called an AST interpreter. What you do is you compile your, your expressions in your language to a tree, a tree data structure. So if you have an add, you'll have an add node and two child nodes, which are the two numbers you're adding together. So that's what this uh, data structure is on the, the left with the, the brown circles. The problem is that's slow. It's like a visitor pattern. So you're continually going from one object to another, jumping around, following references. It's all over the place in the heap. So it's a really slow thing to do. And it also has to be able to handle anything. So in languages other than Java, such as Ruby and Python, operations generally work on any types. So if you have an add, it will work on any types. And whenever you execute that add node, it has to think about what are these types I've got, therefore what do I need to do? And the idea of the truffle system is that the AST becomes gradually typed over time. So when you execute an operation, if it sees two integers as input, the add operation will become an add integer node. It will become effectively statically typed like Java is as it runs, as it realizes what types you're actually putting through the system. And then you'll get this tree which is specialized for the data that's actually running through your program. And then what we do is Truffle will automatically take all the methods which are involved in executing your program and will compile them as one to produce a single piece of machine code. So if you have a program which is this big tree of nodes for all these operations, that can be compiled into a single piece of machine code by the JIT compiler, by Graal, uh, to make it really fast. We can also do the opposite. So I said that we sort of statically type your program based on the types going through it. If those types change, because that's perfectly legal in many programming languages, we can reverse the process. We can take a piece of jitted code that's running with particular types. We can put it back into this AST interpreter. We can change the types, and then we can recompile it. So we're able to make your program static, uh, very tight, very small, refined as much as it can be for your particular program that's running and your particular data going through it. And then we're always able to reverse that, change, and then condense again. This is how we make programs fast, by condensing them down. As long as we can always reverse that, we can do it really aggressively. Because if we get it wrong, we can always just back out of it. So if you ever see a program and it's an obvious that there'll be one thing almost always happening, but you think, oh, there's some little edge case, we can ignore that edge case because we can go back and then recompile afterwards. So I'll talk about it in a different way to make sure it's clear. If we have this expression x plus y times z, the, the parsing phase produces this data structure, which is the AST. Um, and if you execute this, you'll effectively do the visitor pattern on it. So you'll visit the add and then the multiply, and you'll do y, z, and multiply them together and pass that back up the tree to, to evaluate the expression. And what some languages do to be a little bit faster, they produce this um, this bytecode from it, that's what sort of what Java bytecode looks like, and then they, the JIT compiler um, will produce actual machine code from it. And doing all those steps are complicated. Producing bytecode is fairly complicated. Producing good machine code from a program is extraordinarily complicated. And what Graal and Truffle do is they remove these steps for you. So you still have the Java bytecode, 
um, in the program, but it's produced for you and then the machine code is produced for you and all you need to worry about is that simple way of writing interpreters. So that bit's sort of taken care of for, uh, for you because the, program's written, the interpreter's written in Java itself. So Graal. Those of you who know about the JVM probably know that there is a, a part of the JVM called Hotspot, which is the, the compiler and the runtime system within the, the JVM. The problem with Hotspot is it's a, a big black box. It's written in C++ instead of being written in Java. So for someone who's a Java expert, it's not as accessible as it could be. Um, even for someone who knows C++, it's an extremely complicated piece of technology. There aren't many people who know how Hotspot works really well. It's very hard to modify it because it's a very large, complicated, very intricately designed uh, piece of technology. And all you can do when you're writing a guest language on the JVM normally is throw some bytecode at it and hope that it does what you'd like it to do with it. Those of you who are running complicated, high-performance applications on the JVM probably feel this kind of way anyway, and that you have class files, you'd like to run them, and Java should make them nice and fast, but it doesn't always, and you can't understand why easily, because of it's a big black box. Though there are tools to help you, it's still quite complicated. Somewhere in there, there's the JIT compiler, and you'd hope that when you put bytecode in, it finds its way down to that JIT compiler, but it won't always necessarily do, and it's hard to figure out why, and it's hard to make sure that it will get there. What Graal is, is taking that JIT compiler component and taking it outside of Hotspot. We've rewritten the C2 compiler um, into, effectively into Java. Um, the, where it actually came from originally is a bit more complicated than that, but you can think about it like that. It's effectively taking C2 and making it a, a Java application. And then it's just Java code, so you can understand it and use it like you would any other Java library. So this, this component, which used to be inside the black box, is now something that's outside and externally visible. And because it's just a Java library, you can call methods on it, you can get information from it, you can send it extra information and control it precisely. And because it's written in Java, it's much, much easier to understand. And because it's newer code as well, it, it's got a better design and it's easier to work with and easier to make new optimizations. How this works in practice is you've got the JVM which control, which contains all these um, components such as the garbage collector, the JIT compiler, the class loader, everything else that JVM has. Um, but you may not know there are actually a couple of different JIT compilers. There's the, the server compiler and there's the client compiler, that's C1 and C2 you may know of. And Graal is just another one of those compilers, even though it lives outside the JVM normally. This is good because it means that all the other components are staying the same. Graal started off as a research project inside something called the Maxine VM, which was a Java implementation of the whole of the JVM. And because of that, it was a large project. It was never going to be production ready. By making it just the JIT compiler that's written in Java, everything else stays really high quality from Hotspot, really high production quality. So this means Graal is something we'd like to, people to be able to start using in production at some point. Um, it's not just a research project. All Graal does is it takes in bytecode from the JVM, it takes in metadata, and it produces machine code. And it literally produces machine code as a, a byte array of instructions. Um, so we can do whatever we like in Graal to produce any kind of machine code we like in any way we like uh, and emit it. Uh, so we've got lots of control in Graal to do really interesting optimizations. Graal is high performance. It's about as fast as the server compiler at the moment, which is a big achievement considering how long the server compiler has been worked on, how many engineers, how much time and money has been put into it. We've now achieved the same thing with our compiler written in, in Java. Um, and because the design is newer, because the, the, the structure of the code is better, we think it will get faster and faster over time because it's easier to add new optimizations to. But it's already the same sort of level as the, the C2 compiler. Will you ever be able to use Graal for real? I've said it's a, it's a modified JIT compiler, it uses a modified JVM, that sounds like something that's it's hard to deploy. What we've done to tackle this is, there's a very small part of the, the Graal code which interfaces with Hotspot, which is the, the bit written in C++. And what we've done is we've split that bit off. So in Java 9, the interface we need will be available. And this means that you can get Graal the JIT compiler from Maven or from anywhere else. And you just download it as a normal JAR file, and that includes your JIT compiler, and it plugs into Java 9. 
It's already been merged into the Java 9 EA builds. It's not quite functional for what we need yet, but it's going to be there in, in Java 9. Uh, so this means you won't need a, a new modified JVM to run this. You can simply pull in a new JIT compiler for Maven. And how fantastic is that? You can actually get a new different JIT compiler from Maven as one of your dependencies. Um, and you can also modify it and then just attach that modified jar if you wanted to. This isn't something you'd be able to do before. You can debug the compiler as well. It's just a Java application, so you can, you can debug it, you can see what it's doing, change it. You can get Graal now um, from the Oracle Technology Network. If you Google for OTN Graal, you'll find it. Um, as I said, the version in JDK 9 EA isn't quite functional yet, so we produce a a download that has Graal that's all set up properly and also includes all the languages which run on Graal and Truffle, which is the main bit I'm going to be talking about. It's open source as well. It's on GitHub, so you can, uh, you can view the source code on there. You can even send pull requests if you're um, signed up to the Oracle Contributor Agreement. So let's talk about Ruby. I'm just using Ruby as one example of a language running on the, the JVM. Um, so if you're not terribly familiar with Ruby, the examples aren't complicated, but you can almost in your mind think Python or JavaScript if you wanted to. Just translate it in, in your mind. Ruby has an existing implementation on the JVM called JRuby, and it JITs by emitting this JVM bytecode, and this is where the problem comes in, in that they can produce this JVM bytecode, but they can't control precisely what happens to it. So JRuby is a fast implementation of Ruby. It's faster than the, the implementation written in C, but it's not a huge amount faster yet. Um, their VM is written in Java, and their, their core library is also written in Java. There's another implementation of Ruby called Rubinius, this JITs by emitting LLVM code. LLVM is another compiler infrastructure project used for native code, usually. Um, and their VM is written in C++, and their core library is written in mostly Ruby. So we can compare against this later on. This is a, a C++ implementation which has its own JIT, um, and we can compare against the performance of that. Our implementation is called JRuby Truffle, and it's a combination of code from the two. So our project is built on the work of JRuby and Rubinius, and we're very grateful to those two projects uh, for the code they've written, because it's made it easier for us to get to the point where we are today. <coughs> JRuby plus Truffle is a compatible implementation of Ruby. So we're not talking about just toy implementations of languages here. Quite often there's a problem where people try a new implementation of a language, it doesn't really implement the language. And it's very easy to take a tiny little shortcut here, a tiny little shortcut there, and then it's so much faster because if you just avoided the difficult parts. So being really high conformant implementation of Ruby is important to us, and we pass 100% every single one of the Ruby spec um, language specs. The specs don't quite cover the whole language, but it's everything everyone has ever thought has been reasonable to write a spec for, we pass. And then we're actually the only alternative implementation of Ruby to do that. So we're not just as conformant as other implementations, we are more so. We support about 90% of the core library, so there's still quite a lot of work to do. If you know Ruby, you'll know that the big Ruby framework is Rails. Rails is a massive, really, really complicated piece of software. Um, so running it is a, a big ask, and we've been going for a couple of years, but we do now basically run Rails. This is the only evidence I have for it. There are no sites running Rails. I can't really show a demo, but if you run Rails, it will show the messages it's supposed to, and it will serve requests. So we, we've got to that basic point. Uh, sorry, I'll be showing that. Why is Ruby apparently so hard to make fast? So it was on the right-hand side of that spectrum of languages. Um, and it was one of the slower ones. Why are some languages so much slower than the others? It's not just about how much money has been put into them. Some languages are, they have features which are inherently harder to optimize. And this all comes down to how do people want to write Ruby. I'll show you some examples about the way people typically write Ruby. Um, and they use features which are extremely hard to optimize. You wouldn't normally put in something like a Java program. Um, so this is an example of a, a method on the object class. In Ruby, you can open classes and add new methods to them at any time. And this method here is called blank. Uh, the question mark's part of the method name. And this method says, if you've got an array or a, a dictionary map or some other reference, I want you to turn false if it, I want you to turn true, sorry, if it's empty or if it's nil or something like that. Um, and the way they do this is they say, if the object responds to, and that means does it have the method empty, then call empty. 
um, on it. That means it's kind of doing reflection. So each time you call this method, it's saying look up and it's effectively doing get class dot get method and asking if that returns a null result. So this, this operation here that looks quite innocent is actually doing reflection. And if you've ever worked on high performance Ruby apps, you know you probably, uh, high performance Java apps, you know you probably don't want to do reflection on, on something that's done a lot. So people use reflection all the time in Ruby as a, a normal way of programming. It's called meta programming in Ruby. This is an example of something from an image processing library. Um, this does hard mix, which is a Photoshop filter, a way of combining layers in Photoshop. This code uh, composites Photoshop files. So this is run for every single pixel. It takes in a foreground color and a background color, and it's run for every single pixel. And you can see they get the colors from the pixel by calling these RGB methods. Now those methods aren't defined in this module. Instead what they do is they define this method missing, which is like a Java proxy interface, which says if you call a method on it and I don't know what the <laughs> method is, call this method instead. And then what it does is it looks in a different module, chunky PNG color, and sends the method there if it responds to it. So again, this is using reflection. It's effectively doing a reflective method lookup and then call. And it's doing that seven times, I think, for each pixel in an image as it composites it, which seems like a crazy thing to do. But this is how people want to program in Ruby. So we'd like to make it so they can do this if they want to without having low performance. This is even more extreme. This is about decoding a, a grayscale image and looking up grayscale values. What they do here is they've got different versions of this decode PNG resample method for different bit depths. And instead of having like an if saying, if it's 8-bit, call this, if it's 16-bit, call this, they've dynamically created the name of the method. That's what the, the hash and then curly brackets means. He puts this string inside this string. So they work out the, the method name dynamically and then call that. So they're not just doing reflection, they're creating a string at runtime, and this is for every single pixel. This is a duration class, so it's a time value, a time duration, and it wraps a normal time value, and they want it to be that you could call normal time values on it, normal time methods on it. So they define method missing, and if you call a method not defined on duration, it'll forward it to the value that's encapsulated within this object. So again, it's using this send operation. So instead of doing a normal method call, again, it's doing reflection to call this method. Here, they try and speed that up. So they found that was slow. So what they did was this delegate method dynamically defines a new method by using eval. So evals this string to add this new method. So we're using eval. And all those examples are from real applications where um, it's being used in an inner loop. It's not just some corner case they use to set something up or mock something for testing, it's, it's real code. This is a favorite example of mine, and I'll pull this apart later on. This is clamping. So we want, we've got a number, we want to put it between a minimum and a maximum. So what they do is they put it in an array, that's an array literal, they sort it, and then they take the middle value. So that makes sense as a way to clamp a value, because you've got the lowest value to the left, the highest value to the right, and the value you want in the middle. But the problem is it creates an array. It sorts it, which creates a new array, and then they index it. If that's happening for numerical code and you're in a loop, that's generating tons and tons of garbage. But it's a nice way to write clamp, actually. So if we could write like that, maybe that's a good thing to do. Um, and this example here, this is for generating HTML from a, a set of data um, in a report. So if you're returning a, a report from some data, they use this uh, module called ERB, and this does an eval. So this is doing an eval every time a page is rendered in a web app. People might think they don't use eval in their code, but the tools they're using, like ERB, this templating library, do use eval. To show the, the difference in performance, this is a, a benchmarking tool called Benchmark IPS, and what it, lets, what it lets you do is write, each one of these lines has a name, and then a piece of, jar, a piece of Ruby code it runs and calculates how fast it is. So it's like uh, Java micro benchmarking harness, if you've used that for Ruby. So it looks at different ways of doing 14 plus 2. We could write just 14 plus 2, or we could do 14 send and give it a, a symbol. A symbol is like an intern string. Or you could call it with an any, any old string, which could be anything, or you can run eval. And the problem is that sending is, two, uh, is three times slower, or seven and a half times slower if you use a string, and eval is 200 times slower. And as we said, people are actually using that stuff. So it's not something that's it's rarely used. And that's why Ruby is often slow, because people use these patterns. 
One solution for this is to throw away that metaprogramming, that way of that reflection that these Ruby programs use. There's a language called Crystal, which is effectively Ruby without the metaprogramming that's statically compiled. It's a great project, it produces really fast programs, but it's a shame that we have to do that to make Ruby fast. Rubinius, it doesn't support a functionality called set trace func, which is like a debugger for Ruby. Uh, Joey doesn't support that, and it doesn't support object space. Object space is a way to look at all your objects in your program. And Ruby Motion, which is Ruby on iPhones and Android devices, that doesn't support eval. It doesn't support a class called binding, which allows you to look at your local variables. And it's a real shame that you have to throw away features to make it fast. So how does Graal and Truffle solve this? How does it make those programs fast? We use two techniques called escape analysis and partial evaluation. Escape analysis is about taking objects and instead of allocating on the heap, virtually allocate them. It's a technique that the JVM does anyway, but because Graal is a, a better engineer compiler, in my opinion, it was easy for us to add new forms of escape analysis, which are even more powerful. Partial evaluation means running your program at compile time. And remember, when I say compiler, I mean JIT compiler, so it's at JIT compile time. Um, so if we can run your program as far as possible at compile time, then we don't need to run so much at runtime. So let's take this example. It's a slightly simpler case of the, the uh, clamp function. So I'm just doing a minimum, A of B, and I want to sort them, and I'll take the first value, and that, that gives me a, a sorting of them. And I'll call it with two constants, two and eight. Let's think about what Graal will do when it partially evaluates this. Well, the first thing you do is it can inline that call to min. So it can put the body of min into um, where it's called. Uh, so we can simply say 28 sort and take the, the first value. Now we can take the sort function and we can explode that. So you can replace the call with sort to code which does the same thing as that sort, but with those particular values inserted into it. So not only have we inlined the method, we've also taken what is a complicated piece of code, a sort algorithm with loops and things like that, and we can execute it as far as we can to produce just the operations which are left, and we call those the residual operations. So we can take a sort routine and we can expand it, especially for two elements like this. Um, so we do the comparison. The, the operator at the top, the less than equals greater than means um, dot compare, like in Java. So you get minus one or, or one if it's less than or greater than. Um, but because we index it, we only take the first value. So we can plug that directly in. And we can say, we'll, we'll plug in that T1 to where, it, where that value originally came from. Then we don't need to calculate the rest. And then we don't need to allocate the array. So we've saved allocating two arrays there. And at this step, we've gone from being a piece of code which allocates something to a piece of code which doesn't allocate anything. And that's a huge difference. People who work on really high performance Java apps spend a lot of time trying to reduce allocation. They allocate stuff once and then keep reusing it and stuff like that. We've done that automatically here. We've taken code which did allocate something and, and moved on so it doesn't. Then we can run that comparison because it had constant values in it. Um, we can keep going. So we know that T0 is less than zero. So let's just say that's true. And then if it's true, we can get rid of that, that if, and then we can simply plug the value in there. So we've taken a really high level piece of code which used these arrays, it ran a sort routine, it produced another array, indexed it, and we removed all that code and produced a single value. And that's partial evaluation. That, that's all that's left, that's the residual program. Now, if, if we didn't have constant values there, because programs don't often run with only constant values, so if we had variables A and B, we can, we can leave those in and still keep running the program as far as we can. So we can, we can keep going there, we can keep going there, and we were left with this residual program. So even though the values aren't constant, we can still go as far as we can with them being constant. And this same thing applies to all that metaprogramming. So if you do reflection, we can run that reflection at compile time as far as we can. And we can even do it for multiple values. So if you dynamically create your method names you're doing this reflection on, we can do it for all the methods we've seen you do it on before and cache them like that. So this reduces all the complexity you get in a, a dynamic Ruby program. So I ran this same benchmark. This is the benchmark we saw earlier with these different ways of calling send. And it was really, really slow on the existing implementations of Ruby. But for us, not only is the direct code faster, so it's gone from uh, 3.7 
two, seven, three at the top there. But the other implementations are just as fast. There's an error in the measurement here, which I don't show. So there's sort of a plus minus. And actually, they all fall within that plus minus. So they're all statistically as, as fast as each other. So it doesn't matter that you use that eval, that fancy eval. Or it doesn't matter that you use that fancy send method. The program runs just as fast anyway. And that enables programmers to use these advanced languages like Ruby, JavaScript, Python, R, and not worry about the cost of what they're doing to the same extent. Here's an extreme example. Um, I hope you can see that. This is, this is code taken from an image processing library. And it starts on the right. So we create a new bar object. And then we have this, this loop, which records the time and, and prints out the time for a million iterations. And it calls bar.foo 1486. Now, the bar class doesn't have a foo method. But it does have a method missing defined on it. Uh, we say if the foo module, which is defined above it, does have that method, then send it to it. And then foo in the foo method, that does that has three parameters, A, B, C. It puts them in a hash, which is like a map. It then maps that map to get the values out. It puts them in an array. It takes the first one. It puts them all three of them in an array. It sorts it. It takes the middle one. It does X plus Y. So these are all sorts of patterns I saw in interesting Ruby code. So this is really advanced code. We're allocating lots and lots of objects here. And we're also doing quite a lot of implicit objects. So when we call um, foo 486 and it goes to method missing, you see the star in front of args? That's like var args. It's like dot, dot, dot after Java arguments. So it's creating those and putting them in an array. And it takes them out of an array to call the, the, the actual method, et cetera. So there's also extra objects in there. And that looks like a really complicated piece of code. So it's foo goes to the method missing. But because of we can see that foo does implement that method at compile time, we can remove that. And then it does foo passing it up to the module. And then it passes those values through this pattern here. So it goes from there to the, to the method missing. It goes to the send. And the values come out there. Now, if you were to, um, and then they, sorry, and then it goes through that method there. So if you actually run this program, it's, it comes out as 22 at the end. And what we'd like to see is, can Trough and Graal reduce that whole program down to that constant value through all this massive complexity, through all this reflection, through all these objects? And the answer is yes, it can. And I can demonstrate that in a couple of ways. This is the speed of that benchmark on different implementations of Ruby. The red is the standard Ruby. The blue is JRuby, so you can see it's about uh, three and a half times faster, which is not bad. The gray is the C++ implementation, which is even slower than a normal implementation. And the green is um, Ruby implemented using the same technology as PyPy, which you may have heard of. It's a tracing JIT. It's very advanced. Um, and that's a bit slower than JRuby. Now, if I put JRuby Truffle on this graph, I have to shrink everything else because it's so much faster. And it's actually around 1,000 times faster, three orders of magnitude faster. I could look at it in another way. This is a tool we have for inspecting um, what the compiler is doing inside. Um, so this is how, your, how the compiler thinks about your program. What we have here are nodes, which are um, some form of computation. We have these lines, and the red lines are control flow. So it means do this thing, then do that thing, then do that thing going down the screen. And we have data flow, which means get this, this value from here, get this value from here going up the screen. Um, and if you look at the last node, it's a return statement. It is boxing, and the, the value it's boxed in is a constant value 22. So as well as showing the program is faster, this is proving that it has reduced it at compile time in the JIT compiler down to the value of 22. That's not something that the current generation of JVN technology is able to do with Java programs. And it's certainly not something that the current generation of Ruby program of Ruby interpreters is able to do with Ruby. So this is this is a first for this kind of technology on these languages. I can also show you the actual machine code. So this is XA, XA664 machine code. And it moves the boxed integer 22 into the register REX and then it returns. So that's all that program does. In reality, it also has some other logic ahead of this has quite a lot of guards which check that things haven't changed and that its assumptions are still valid. But the value which comes out of it is 22. And that means that if you had any other computation coming after that, it could keep being constant folded like that. If we, that's an extreme example, deliberately designed to provoke these optimizations. If we look at a range of programs where uh, 
between 10 and, and 20 times faster and for about 43 benchmarks, I think it is. This is slightly old data. We were uh, around 20 times faster. So this system doesn't just work for one language. I've used Ruby as an example because that's the, the implementation I work on. But it also works for JavaScript. We have uh, big efforts working on JavaScript and R. There's small efforts working on Python and Smalltalk and a few other languages. Um, but Ruby and JavaScript and R are the big ones. Uh, and we have exactly the same kind of technology applied to those languages. And we can use the languages from each other. Um, so in Ruby, if you write 14 plus 2, you can also write execjs, which is a library for running JavaScript. It's like Nashorn in, it runs JavaScript on the JVM. Execjs runs JavaScript inside Ruby interpreters. And you can write execjs eval 14.2. And I can write a, the same benchmark that I did earlier. And on, on MRI, it's 3,400 times slower to run that JavaScript instead of running that Ruby. On our system, it's exactly the same speed. So not only can we partially evaluate through things like eval and, and reflection, we can also do it from one language to another. And there's no cost to doing that. So if you have a program that's written mainly in Ruby, but has some R to do some, some statistical work, you can go between the two without any cost. So the conclusion for this is that simple VM ideas can solve the major problems of making Ruby fast. The big idea is fairly simple. You can explain that in a few slides. The implementation is, is really complicated. So Graal is, is an advanced piece of technology. Um, but the, the ideas are fairly simple, and they work at making these languages fast. And we don't need to tell Ruby programmers to avoid language features to get performance. Um, ideally, in the future, we'd like to be able to say that um, you don't need to spend all your time optimizing your program in the same way as you would have done. We can, we can help make it fast for you. Obviously, we, don't, we can't solve algorithmic complexity, but uh, for things that you think are expensive to use, like reflection, but you want to use because they make your life easier, we can, we can solve those sort of problems for you. Where to get more info? If you want to know more about Ruby, there's a great book called Ruby on the Microscope, which explains how Ruby works. Um, if you search for Joey Truffle, or we'll go to that URL. I've got a series of blog posts and papers about it. And this became my PhD thesis as well, specializing in dynamic techniques for implementing the Ruby program language. Um, there's been several PhD theses produced from the work on Graal and Truffle already. There's a really large group of people involved in this. So working on Ruby specifically, the work I've talked about today, there's Benoit, Kevin and Peter and myself but there's all these other people who work or have worked on Graal and Truffle. So Oracle's investing quite a lot of time in this project. Um, and when the Graal compiler becomes readily usable on Java 8, um, you should be able to start seeing some of this benefit. And I should say Graal, of course, works for Java as well. It doesn't make a huge difference as it does to Ruby code, but we hope over time that the, the advancements in the, the Java JIT will be done on Graal because it's easier to do. It's easier to do research there and make improvements. That's my contact information. I've got, um, I've got a couple of minutes still. I can show you an example of, that's absolutely tiny. I'll have to go to presentation mode when I, uh, there's a presentation mode, isn't there in Eclipse? I'll just turn my font size up. Sorry, one second. Do you want to know where the font size in is at Clips? Ah. Right, and so I'll start in IntelliJ. Uh. Right, so this is the implementation of Ruby. And what I want to do is trace through a piece of code from the guest language to the JIT compiler. So you can see how conceptually simple and how easy it is to work with this code. So if you add together two integers in Ruby, we call something called exact math, which is something that's in Java 8. It allows you to do addition and get an exception if it overflows. Um, so we can call it add exact A and B. Now, if I jump back to um, Eclipse, um, I know that there's a class called, it's too large now. So 
So I know there's a class called Truffle Graph Builder Plugin. So it requires a bit of knowledge to do a jump here, but everything else I'm going to do, I'm going to do by following definition or going to implementation. Um, now, if I search for add exact, I can find this is where the JIT compiler realizes you're calling this add exact method. And then it creates something called a, um, an integer add exact node. And what we have here is the node which represents that, imp that, uh, implementation, that operation inside the compiler. Um, and there's, there's operations here for doing things like simplifying it, making it a canonical and uh, reducing any kind of redundancy. Um, and there's this operation here, integer add exact split node. And what I'm going to show you is we have here something here called generate arithmetic, and we have this emit add. So if I follow that and I go to the implementation of it, uh, and I go to the implementation of emit add there, I can look at the AMD64 version, and I can see where it says emit binary, and I can follow the, the implementation of that, and keep following it. And here we go. We've followed it all the way down to the assembler. So MASM is our ref reference to the assembler, and I'm saying add this code for this add, and I can keep following it. And eventually, we get to the point where it's actually pushing a, a byte of machine code onto the end of this in, the instruction. So everything, all the way from where it realizes what the class is to where it emits that machine code is in Java. And that's the kind of high-level um, code we've got in this, this compiler, rather than working in all the stuff in C++. So that's the end of my presentation. Thanks so much. Are there any questions? <laughs>